All right, we're hanging around 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I'm going to do 5, 6, 7, 8, and I'm working on 9 now. But what we're looking at here in terms of information, 2 through 8, no, you yourselves do wrong and cheat, and do you you do these things to your brethren? So he's, Paul is asking the six rhetorical questions. And he has in view here, you go to law against one another. Why do you rather accept wrong? Why do you not rather let yourselves be cheated? Why do you not rather accept wrong, and why do you not let yourselves be cheated? And we'll look at Romans chapter 13, what Paul has to say on this matter there. It's absolute consistency of the Bible. Romans 13, 1. See, we're supposed to handle mundane matters in a godly manner, no matter how small, except amongst yourselves. Now, but they were not to, by, to bypass applicable civil laws within their society that they might be bound to obey. So there's kind of a a balancing act the believer has to do. And Paul says in Romans 13, Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. So what concerned Paul was that the Corinthians were failing to exercise their godly responsibilities in many ways, such as properly setting, settling cases of dispute amongst themselves instead of using unauthorized, unsuitable civil authority as a means to gain advantage, profit by, or punish one another. Christians don't do that. All of this in the light in the light of their grand eternal destiny of co-ruling with Christ as the wife of Christ when they will be judging the world and the fallen angels and all that that entails. Of course, you figure out what the balance is, dig your nose into the Bible like we're doing here. So then in 1 Corinthians 6, 4, which reads, So if you tell, if you have civil law courts dealing with the matters of this life, would you appoint them as judge or of no account in the church to officiate over judicial matters, matters of dispute within the church, even on matters of faith? You're going to bring that to court? Bible Allen's Commentary says on 1 Corinthians 6, 4, so if you have law courts dealing with matters of this life, do you appoint them as judges who are of no accounts in the church, i.e. have no function in the congregation in such matters? They may not even be believers. See, because of their greed, dishonored gods. So because of greed, dishonored God, Paul concluded that the important issue was lost before the case had begun. He therefore said that mundane loss was preferable to the spiritual loss which the lawsuits produce. By and large, people are nitpicking. So give up the little thing that you think is due you for the sake of the brotherhood and the continuity and fellowship you have with your body of Christ. Be fortunate. I have not found for decades a body of Christ, a local church, that would even let me in the front door or if I went to one service which happened before Christmas, they were interrogating me, wanting to know where I stood. And so I decided to ask questions of them, but not uh, challenging questions, questions on the basis of what's the gospel? And uh, uh, is the Bible inerrant? So get their point of view on it. They said, don't come back. You ask too many questions. They're allowed to ask questions of me and drill me up and down. What color socks do I wear and so on? Well, they want to know nitpicking, but I'm not allowed to ask simple things like, what must the man do to be saved? Because the repent word came out, you have to turn from all your sins. And then I asked the question, has anybody here, raise your hand, have, have just a moment, even today, of without sin, sinless perfection? Not a single one raised their hand. Then, of course, shortly thereafter, they don't come back. You're putting me to the test. Why can't I ask you a question that's critical? So because their greed dishonored God, Paul concluded that the important issue was lost before the case had begun. He therefore said to that, that mundane loss was preferable to the spiritual loss which the lawsuits produced. Too much damage. As it was, the Corinthian lawsuits seemed not to have been so much a matter of redressing wrong or seeing justice served 
as a means as as a means for personal gratification at the expense of fellow believers. I say, and it was used instead as a means of for personal gratification at the expense of fellow believers. Personal gratification even even profit at the expense of fellow believers. Making a few bucks on the believers. This was the body life at its worst. Compare Expositor's Bible Commentary in 1 Corinthians 6, 4. It is uncertain whether the main verb, meaning a point, should be taken as imperative, a command, with a sarcastic tone, or as an indicative statement of fact in a rhetorical question. In the first instance, the thought is this. If you must have disputes about these mundane matters, when you are destined to judge men and angels, well then go ahead and set the least, least esteemed members of the congregation to take care of these little matters. But you kind of shirking your own authority in the church. But I think, but this sarcastic, ironic tone seems to fit well into the context. Note, my own personal, that a sarcastic, ironic tone seems seems to fit well into the context. On the second interpretation, the emphasis is on the apostles' surprise. If you have such a case, do you set the least esteemed in the church in charge of it? The answer then, which Paul gives, is no, of course not. With the assumed concluding question as to why then would they turn these affairs over to the unsaved who know even less about Christian affairs? These are sometimes personal matters. I borrowed money from you, I didn't return it, so on and so forth. You can take that to court. But if it's a nominal thing, or one guy thought, I thought you were just giving me, out of the kindness of your Christian heart, the money to get through the day. And you turn and change your mind, you want to sue me and get in court and get double. That's not how you deal with brethren in the faith. The first option seems better, since it fits in with Paul's other ironic remarks, sarcastic remarks, to the Christians, to the Corinthian Christians, such as in Corinthians 1, 1 Corinthians 4, 8. For the second interpretation, the material is too elliptical and demands too much to be supplied. Some have tried to take the phrase men of little account as referring to the unsaved judges, but there is no evidence in the context that the Corinthians despise these judges. What's right is right within a Christian fellowship uh, uh, format. Note that the form of the Greek word rendered a point in 1 Corinthians 6, 4, quoted above, may be a statement of fact, indicative mood, or a command, or imperative mood. And note that the NIV has taken it to render a point as a command, making it a difficult phrase of little account refer to those in the church not too highly esteemed for their wisdom. On the other hand, considering the ongoing criticism Paul is laying upon the Corinthian believers, Paul considered them more than adequate for the task of handling their own business within the confines of the congregation and in a godly manner. So the sad refrain of verse 1, to which Paul would refer yet a third time in verse 6, was thus heard again. Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to law before the unrighteous unbelievers and not before the saints? Because there's an agenda there. Most people uh, don't like uh, Christians, especially if they're active. And you bring up open a dispute within the church, but they're all over it. And they're going to exaggerate it and say, this is the way everybody, every Christian acts. Here's in view of verse 5, which follows. I say this to your shame. Is it so that there is not among you one wise man who will be able to decide between his brethren on issues without involving unbelievers? So that participle translated men of no account in the church relative to matters of dispute in 1 Corinthians 6, 4, is best rendered men who have no standing in the church, that is, the non-Christians or unqualified, unappointed unbelievers to judge matters within the body of Christ, which would be beyond their capacity being without the Holy Spirit. So in the expression rendered, so if you have civil law, 
courts dealing with matters of this life, this is 1 Corinthians 6, 4, Paul means to include different kinds of property cases that are part of civil law. He strongly admonishes, rather, then, then commands Christians to take their legal grievances for settlement before qualified Christians, believers, and not unbelievers, albeit they often do have the option to take it to civil court where unbelievers might rule, but they should not do so in order to gain an undue godly advantage or to punish, get even with a fellow believer. The key is to do the godly thing and not take undue recompense nor attempt to punish nor attempt to get even nor attempt to, to take advantage of other fellow believers nor gain a small part of profit that's not really that warranted. It's not that big issue. Just because they might gain a favorable advantage, a favorable result, result which is neither fair nor godly nor an expression of godly agape self-sacrificial love toward one another. And if other people in the congregation see this, they're going to they're going to tattoo you. They're going to uh, identify you with being uh, small-minded and uh, uh, don't be around them. So you, you've lost fellowship. So Paul allows for the possibility that under some circumstances, Christians may take cases to the secular court as well. But the same end must be attempted to do the godly agape thing, not maintain a small profit, which you weren't necessarily wanting to do anyway. So there's Romans 13.1. So, as a cross-reference, whereupon in the next four verses, Paul explains about what he has written about in 1 Corinthians 6, 1-4, which reads as follows, There any of you having a matter against one another, go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints, which is reviewing. Do you not know that the saints will judge the world, and if the world will be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters, little, literally civil court cases, I can't emphasize this enough. You look to yourself in eternity, future, and think of this question. Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? They will. And if the world will be judged by you, and are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters, civil court cases, law court cases, relative to the people in the congregation? Do you not know that we shall judge angels and how much more things that pertain into this life? How important are you in eternity? And then you got to be petty now in the temporal life, nickeling, diming people, uh, and then you're a grandiose judge of the angels, co-ruling with Christ. So if you have law courts dealing with matters of this life, do you appoint them as judges who are of no account in the church, i.e., have no function in the congregation on such matters because they are not believers? For this is to their shame. As we move on to verse 5, which author and apostle Paul points out in the next four verses as follows. I say this to your shame. Is it so that there is not among you one wise man who will be able to decide between his brethren on issues that are not that consequential? They're tiny matters. So the believers at Corinth were shameful in how they conducted themselves. Paul asks them, Was there one wise man among you who was able to decide the issues that the brethren had with one another in a godly way, instead of going to civil court in these issues? And those issues were more often than not for undue gain at the expense of a fellow believer. Maybe there's just a misunderstanding. Well, don't nickel and dime people. Be gracious. What did Christ do on the cross? Did he nickel and dime the sins? Well, I don't like that. I'll just pay for that sin. Really? 6-6. Six, six. But brother goes to law with brother and that before unbelievers. So instead of godly wisdom being exercised within the congregation by qualified mature believers in order to resolve legitimate and not greedy for gain issues in a godly manner between believers, and it'll be known throughout the congregation if you're petty, and uh, unloving, no agape love expressed, which is uh, giving people not what they're due, but going overboard to give, uh, treat them in a godly manner to build them up. So a brother goes to law court against a brother, and even let an unbeliever decide the issues in order to event, evidently gain undue ungodly advantage or to punish, get even with a fellow believer without any sense of agape, self-sacrificial godly love. Paul argues that if it is really necessary for such disputes to be handled, they should find a Christian wise enough